You're now listening to a Binge for Brain podcast, a show that teaches simple neuroscience-based strategies to ending binge eating, overeating, and emotional eating through the inside-out understanding of your habits. I'm Natalia, your host, and I'm here to help you create wellness without the obsession. Let's get started. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to the Binge Brew Brain podcast. In today's episode, I'm going to answer the question, how long does it take to recover from binge eating? We are going to talk about how do you even know when you are fully recovered? And I'm going to share with you my own story. I'm going to tell you exactly how long it took me to stop binge eating and then stop all disordered behaviors. Okay, so let's get started with the question, you know, how do you know that you are recovered? And I'm going to start with explaining what other people say about being recovered, because as you know, however many people you're going to ask this question, however many opinions you will have, because everybody has their own perspective. So once I read a book called The Bulimia Help Method, and if I remember correctly, I think that they proposed in this book that you are recovered when you make a decision that you will no longer binge and purge. So with bulimia behaviors, especially with the traditional purging, it's quite easy. Like the line is quite clear. You may purge or not. However, with other compensatory behaviors like exercising or using laxatives, it might be a little bit uh, different, like the line is more fuzzy. And with binge eating, obviously, the line is very fuzzy because binging is subjective. What is a binge for and one person can be a normal meal for another person. We do have criteria for binge eating disorder, However, I don't think that many of you, you know, daily look at the criteria to make sure that you still uh, meet the criteria for binge eating disorder. And once you do not meet those criteria, you're like, oh yeah, I'm fully recovered. (laughs) I don't think that it works that way. So I think that it's important to recognize that maybe your own personal criteria for binge eating are different than the clinical criteria for binge eating eating. And even if you do not meet those clinical criteria, it doesn't mean that you are not suffering. You may still have many disordered eating issues. And another problem is that, you know, we have a binge eating disorder, but people also can binge eat just less frequently. And there are other problematic behaviors like binging versus overeating or emotional eating And also we have disordered eating behaviors. So I personally make a distinction between an eating disorder and disordered eating. But maybe that would be a topic for another podcast episode. Um, I have also a fun fact for you that um, there is... um, institute called the Caroline Costin Institute and they specialize in helping people overcome their eating disorders and they also help uh, people to become eating disorder coaches. And the interesting fact that is that in one of the requirements for coaches, so if you want to become a coach, they say that you need to be recovered for at least two years. So You must be recovered for at least two years in order to become a coach and in order to help other people overcome their eating disorder. So as you see, they've no they noticed that even though you may be like clinically recovered, you may be free from those behaviors, it takes a while for you to practice normal eating behaviors or to get rid of disordered thoughts in order to, you know, help other Uh, people. (laughs) So that was my uh, quick rant about, you know, the the confusion about uh, whether you are recovered or not, what are the criteria. So it's hard for me to give you a definite uh, answer. But my question to you is, why do you want to know? (laughs) Like, why is it so important? It's not like uh, it's about like failing or passing a test. There will be never a test that will tell you whether you are fully recovered or not. It's just the information for you. And after all, 
you decide whether you are recovered or not. And what I also want to highlight is that what is really important is the progress you make. And the real problem is that many people compare themselves. So that's why even the title of today's podcast episode is kind of problematic because some people do recover in a very short period of time, right? For example, I offer three month uh, coaching and there are people who make um, huge progress and there are people who fully recover in like a free uh, months or a couple of months. But there are other people who probably listen to this podcast episode and they've been in active recovery for years. <laughs> That's why in today's podcast episode, I want to answer that question, you know, how long it takes to recover from binge eating based on my own uh, experience. But Let's be honest, I think that you knowing the answer for the question is problematic because you are going to compare yourself. <laughs> so I just want to warn you and remind you that everybody is on their own journey and comparison is a thief of joy. Um, many times, many of you, uh, you've been struggling with an eating disorder for decades. Your eating disorder probably was morphing from restrictive eating to maybe bulimia. Then you were free from eating disorder for a while. Then you struggled with binge eating and so on. So all that history, it will impact how long it's going to take uh, for you to, to recover. But any, <laughs> anyways, I think that what is really important to just um, to just aim for progress, because even uh, if right now you would say that, okay, I feel like I'm 10% recovered from an eating disorder, like even if you won't be able to fully recover within like the next year or two years, like you making a progress is still a victory. Like you going from 10% recovered to like 50% recovered your quality of life will improve, <laughs> it will significantly improve. And then when you go from 10% recover to like 80% recover, it's fantastic. And even if you won't be able to, to, you know, to get rid of those last 10% or 20% of like disorder thoughts, uh, or maybe some <laughs> minor behaviors, then it's still worth it. Recovery is still worth it. And another question I often get asked is, how do I know that I'm fully recovered? <laughs> so again, I don't think that that it matters that much. What matters is just how you feel. Even if you are not there 100%, it's fine because we are not aiming for perfection. We are just aiming for progress. And the interesting part, interesting fact is that I believe that those last uh, couple of percent for you to go from eating disorder to normal eating, those couple of last percentage, um, it happens naturally. It happens without you being focused on eating disorder recovery. When you are, let's say, at 85% to 95% recovered, I think that you subs that you should stop thinking about recovery. Stop pursuing eating disorder recovery. Like those last bits happen by turning away from thinking about your eating disorder and pursuing binge free life and just living your life, like forgetting about this eating disorder. Just um, on a day-to-day -day basis, in order to fully recover, you should stop having even thoughts about recovery. Stop measuring your progress. Stop asking yourself whether you are making a progress or not. Because if you're going to turn your attention away from an eating disorder, it's going to be easier for you to get rid of the remainings of your eating disorder. And maybe after a couple of months, you will go with a friend to a restaurant. And let's say that, um, you know, during uh, the dinner, she will say something a bit alarming, like, hmm, I think I don't deserve dessert. I I've been sitting all day in the office and I probably already crossed my daily calorie limit. <laughs> and in that moment, you will think to yourself like, oh, wow. I used to have these kind of thoughts. And then uh, when you will go back home, you're going to start thinking about it and you're going to realize like, 
oh shit i think i'm i'm fully recovered like i didn't have these kind of thoughts for a while i didn't have any problematic behavior so i guess that i'm okay <laughs> like eating disorder is not the part of my identity it's not even a part of my life and this is how it's going to happen for you <laughs> this is this is what i believe is going to happen for you uh, that at the end of your journey you have to just turn um your turn uh, your attention away from from an eating disorder this is what i did and this is what helped me tremendously now in the second part of today's episode i would like to share with you how long it took me to recover from binge eating so obviously just like with many of you i wanted to stop binge eating the moment i noticed that it's a problem <laughs> the moment i started uh, binge eating however i do not consider those times like me being in recovery yeah sure i tried to stop binge eating by using silly methods like willpower self-discipline uh, some hypnosis <laughs> you know trying to eat in moderation uh, establishing some food rules for myself or just trying to aiming to eat healthy you know promising myself that the next day i'm going to eat clean and so on so yes sure i wanted to stop binge eating but in my opinion the real recovery started when i moved out of my parents house at the end of the august 2016 and i call it the real recovery because that was the moment of my I guess we can call it surrender, you know? I had to be honest with myself. I had to admit what's going on. I had to accept my situation and move away from, <laughs> from methods like willpower and move towards compassion, forgiveness. So for me, the real recovery <laughs> was when I surrendered in a way. And it was it was, it was great because in Christmas 2016, those were my first uh, Christmas time, you know, when I, I didn't binge hard, <laughs> like food wasn't on my mind all the time. And at the beginning of 2017, my binge eating was more like overeating episodes, right? So in 2017, at some point, I felt good enough. Um, and I felt good enough to start my life <laughs> sort of like all over <laughs> again in a different country. Like I decided that I'm ready to move uh, to move on and like leave all of my problems <laughs> behind me. So uh, just if you look at if you will look at this timeline, you would realize that binge eating recovery took me just a couple of months between like six to eight months but even though I was free from eating disorder like like hardcore eating disorder binge eating I would say that I wasn't free from disordered eating but I also didn't realize it at the time what I want to mention is that in 2019 uh, or maybe 18, 19, something like that, I decided that I would like to go back to doing nutrition counseling. So I wanted to help people with nutrition. I wanted to help them eat healthy. And I naturally found myself gravitating towards topics of overheating, eating disorders. So I decided that it, it just makes sense for me to work with people who struggle with binge eating since um, this struggle was so close to my heart and I knew a lot about it. And then when I decided to like niche down um, and, and work only with people who struggle with binge eating, I decided that if I want to help people, I need to know more. <laughs> Somehow I'm, I'm always a person who looks for more knowledge. I want to consume all the resources. So I started reading books about binge eating, even though at the time I was already considering myself fully recovered from binge eating. So then I started reading books like Brain Over Binge, The Fuck It Diet, Just Eat It and Intuitive Eating Book. So especially while reading the book Intuitive Eating, I've noticed something. So my internal, my, my internal dialogue looked something like this, like, wait, uh, I am free of an eating disorder, but I'm kind of not sure if I'm free from disordered eating. <laughs> so I've noticed that I had some problematic behaviors and because I recovered on my own. Nobody guided me through the process. Like I still had many um, problematic thoughts that 
I, I didn't even notice that they were problematic. So I want to give you a couple of examples. For example, <laughs> sorry, sorry for the repetition. So I would allow highly processed foods in my house, but back then I was always aware, you know, where they are. And I was making sure that there weren't like too many kinds that I, I had processed foods in the house, but like not too much and just my my favorite kind of safe items. And I was always aware of them. <laughs> like in my mind, I knew when I, I could be eating them, um, you know, for, for what kind of occasions and so on. I was always uh, hyper aware of, of foods in general so that the foods um, would never g- gone bad in my in my household. For example, when my boyfriend would be frying plant-based burgers for us and I would not notice that, you know, they are like soaked in, in, in fat, in oil, I would, you know, maybe take a paper towel and I would uh, take the extra grease off. <laughs> uh, I was also always hyper aware of, you know, uh, calorie density. So, for example, I would always prefer to add almond milk to my coffee rather than, I don't know, oat milk. <laughs> because I knew that, you know, oat milk has more calories than almond milk. And also I would avoid, the, you know, uh, coconut milk, uh, adding coconut milk to my coffee because I knew that it had too many calories and too many saturated fats. Another example is that I was I would always opt for crisps uh, made out of vegetables <laughs> rather than potatoes. I preferred sweet potato fries over you know general normal white potato uh, French fries. Uh, on the rest days, I would try to avoid eating highly processed foods because I knew that I sort of didn't I don't know didn't deserve it. I was also um, aiming for. Uh, workouts on empty stomach because I knew that they may help me, I don't know, in losing more fat. <laughs> uh, I was definitely also more conscious about my my fasting window, right? So I would try to, in my head, for example, count the hours, uh, how many hours I've been fasting so far. So I would say that these kind of disordered behaviors that were present in my life, like three, four time, four, sorry, three, four years ago, they were highly influenced uh, by wellness culture because back then I, w- I would, um, you know, listening to podcasts about wellness, about health, about longevity uh, and so on. And I would just opt for sort of like healthier choices without even asking myself whether I like this choice. So I would drink matcha tea instead of like regular, I don't know, coffee. I would always try to get the sourdough instead of normal bread, even if it meant that I have to go to a different shop that is further away just so that I can get the the better bread. (laughs) At least I believed that uh, that is better bread. So my disordered eating stemmed from wellness culture and I'm mm, I'm fortunate enough that those were like tiny disordered eating thoughts um, also I can add to uh, add to the story that in 2019 I had very stressful job and I remember that <laughs> at that time I probably had my my last potent binge urge that actually didn't end up as a binge uh, eating episode. I just ended up buying lots of uh, food stuff, but I only ate a couple of cookies and I threw away rest of the food. So in 2019, I would say that I had my last potent uh, binge urge, even though at the time I was free from binge eating for like two years or so. What else can I tell you? Well, after after reading those those books about intuitive eating and after noticing that I do have those sort of tiny disordered behaviors, disordered thoughts, um, yeah, after that, after educating myself more, reading more, after being also a coach, I would say that I naturally healed the remainings of my disordered eating. And I would also say that 
the pandemic time was very healing for me, you know, because we had lots of food in the house so that we can, we, so that we don't have to go to the supermarkets that often the gyms were closed, closed. So, um, I didn't exercise at all and I had to learn like how to eat, how to do not, um, maybe adjust my food intake to my exercise regime. So my food became definitely more intuitive. I was just eating when I was hungry. I didn't have to like wait for my boyfriend to come back from work so that we can eat something because we were all the time in the house. Uh, We will definitely... We were ordering definitely more takeout. We were ordering pizza at least once a week. So for me, the last uh, like healing piece probably happened during uh, during the the pandemic. And now I want to I want to compare it and tell you how my relationship with food looks like right now. And again, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So I always have Brazil nuts in my house because Brazil nuts are very high in uh, selenium. So I have Brazil nuts in the jar. (laughs) And a couple of weeks ago, I opened this jar and they smelled bad. You know, I had those Brazil nuts long enough (laughs) for them to go uh, to went uh, rancid which is unheard of because as I told you a couple of years ago, I was always aware, you know, how many nuts I have. I would try to like portion them uh, them out to just have like 50 grams um, like per seating or something like that. And now I have another example for you, which is just from a couple of days ago. So the thing is that at the beginning of August, um, there were like some limited versions of vegan products in Lidl and I bought many, many of them. Uh, and some of them I ate right away, uh, but there were also uh, some stuff that I wanted to leave for later. So there were like, um, there were also like a small frozen cakes and little version of Ben and Jerry's. So I bought, I remember that I, Uh, put away those two specific products to enjoy them probably on my birthday or when my friends were supposed to visit uh, visit us just before my birthdays Uh, and I want to remind you that uh, it's been almost a month since my 30th birthday and I totally forgot about those items (laughs) recently I opened my freezer and I was looking for um, gyoza dumplings, couldn't find them, opened the last drawer in our freezer and I found those ice creams and mini cakes and I totally forgot about them, which is just a great example because again, previously I was always hyper aware of where and how much junk food I have in a house and I would like in my mind try to like portion them out. <laughs> so now I had a great surprise that, oh, those foods are still here. <laughs> so these kind of things, they didn't happen to me in the first years after recovery. Uh, to summarize my story, I want you to understand that even though the main part of recovery, of binge eating recovery, took me just a couple of months, it doesn't mean that I healed all the parts because probably because I was doing it on my own. And it took me like the main part of binge eating recovery took me only a couple of months because I had lots of time to heal my emotions, to work on my faults and so on. Because back then I didn't have a full-time job. So I was just making a little bit of money as a horse riding instructor and as a private English tutor. But some of you work you may have a job you may go to university you may have a family so probably you don't have that much uh, that much time and resources like mental resources to um to devote to your eating disorder recovery i at the beginning of my recovery i had that time i didn't maybe have energy because i also struggled with with depression but that's just <laughs> another story Anyways, that even though um, the I stopped binge eating within a couple of months, you know, later I decided to become a coach for compulsive eaters. And, and I've noticed that I had some minor issues with disordered eating thoughts. So 
I want you to understand that when telling that story, I can tell you that I recovered from binge eating in just like six to eight months, <laughs> which is great. But also I can tell you that story and uh, somebody else can look at it and say like, no, 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 girl, it took you at least like four years to fully recover from not only eating disorder, but also disordered eating. So it just depends what are the criteria? Where do you draw a, a line between being like recovered, fully recovered, partially recovered, like whatever? And, and at the end, I want to tell you that it all probably, you know, doesn't matter whether you are partially recovered, whether you only stop binge eating, um, you know, whether you are fully recovered. Maybe it doesn't matter as much as you think it matters. What matters is you getting better every day, feeling better every day, thinking about food a little bit less, a little bit less obsessively and so on. So this is what I, what I wish to you, just making progress and not caring that much about all of the setbacks you're gonna have because obviously my line wasn't straight line I didn't I didn't mention that in today's podcast episode but there were many moments when you know in order to take uh, one step forward I first had to take a couple of steps uh, steps back so all I wish you is to do not get discouraged <laughs> do not compare yourself to others and do what you have to do in however long time it's going to take you. Well, I don't know if I structure, structured this sentence correctly, <laughs> but I'm tired at this point. So thank you so much for listening to today's podcast episode. I hope you find it helpful. I hope that, um, that you benefit from me sharing with you um, the part of my recovery. I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> okay, anyways, thank you so much for listening and see you in the next episode. Bye! If you enjoyed today's podcast episode and you would like to stay in touch with me, make sure to follow Binge Pro Brain on Instagram. And if you are ready to take this material to the next level and apply what you've learned, then go ahead and submit your coaching application for my Binge Pro Brain coaching program. Thank you so much for joining me today and have a great day. Bye.